Welcome to Musicians vs. the World, the podcast where we explore aspects of music and musician life that may not have been covered in music school. I am your host, Christine Smith. Vinicius Barbosa Pippa is a Brazilian composer of film, television, and video game scores based in Los Angeles, California. He is a graduate of the renowned Berklee College of Music in screen scoring. Within the first decade of his career, Vinicius was honored with an Emmy nomination, and he continues to be a prolific composer, conductor, and performer, his work ranging from indie films and video games to TV shows and blockbuster Hollywood productions, as well as the stage. Recently, Vinicius was involved in a very special Disney project called Star Wars Galaxy of Adventures, which was a series of animated shorts that recreated some of the most iconic scenes from the Star Wars movies. Under composer Ryan Shore, Vinicius worked as the scoring coordinator for all 54 episodes of the epic reimagination. He is the founder of The Music Giant, a Los Angeles-based music production studio whose services include music scoring and orchestral arranging. So Vinicius, thank you so much for being here and welcome to Musicians vs. the World. Thank you very much for having me. It's a pleasure. It's such a pleasure to have you. I am so excited to chat with you. And just like we were saying before we started recording, there are about a million things that I would love to chat with you about. You have so much experience in such a wide variety of aspects of music making. Um, and so it's difficult to know where to start. So let's just start from your beginning. And how did you become a musician? Did you always know that music was where you wanted to end up? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I would say my, my interest in music developed pretty early because my my father, although he was not a professional musician, he he's always been a, a music connoisseur. So he, you know, he he was always listening to good music in the house and he played a little bit of uh, classical guitar and Brazilian guitar. Oh, and I, I was that was back when I was in Brazil. Um, so he played, you know, Brazilian guitar and played a little bit of piano, a bunch of different instruments. And it was kind of a bonding thing for us, you know, to to sort of listen to music together and and so on and so i very early on i was interested in it and 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 it was kind of a part of my life i didn't really start learning it formally and seriously until i was a, t a teenager which was a little late mm -hmm. um, but once i started then it very quickly became evident that this is what i wanted to do for a living and and then it was a matter of figuring out you know, and things that I'm sure we'll talk about, like which direction specifically do I want to go in, you know, within, within the world of music, there's so many things you can do. You can be a performer, you can be a, you can be a producer, you can be a composer. There's so many things. So, um, it was a matter of sort of narrowing it down from there. You know, what were the things that I was really interested in and what were the things that I, that I seemed to have a knack for and all of that. So, um, eventually, because because another one of the things that kind of was always present in my life was you know great films and great video games and and just great storytelling in general. At some point, I kind of put the two you know the, the two things together, and I and I thought someone has to be writing all these great scores for these video games and these movies and these TV shows. So I think that's what I want to look into. So that yeah. that then took me kind of into my next journey into music education. So what instrument did you sing or did you play an instrument when you were a teenager? I started as a drummer. So that uh, by by heart and by nature, I'm a drummer. Um, <laughs> and and it, was, it, it was interesting to start there because, you know, as, as, as you know, you don't you don't need notes for drums. It's just rhythms. Um, but but soon after I, I began to learn a little bit of piano, I began to learn uh, acoustic and electric guitar. Uh, and I took some singing lessons and choir uh, lessons and all of that. So I I kind of had an all around sort of musical education, but still to this day, I think the, the instrument I'm most comfortable in is still the drum set. Yeah, yeah. Well, and then I would think in Brazil with the drumming, do you find that some of those Brazilian aspects and like that percussive, like, I guess, heart that you have, does that make its way into your music now that you're writing for orchestra? Yeah, I would hope so. Um, I, I think that at least it it makes me approach composition in a from a slightly different direction, right. you know. Um, so yeah, I think so. Yeah, I'm just thinking about that because my instrument is piano. So when I think of a composition, I would think more about the harmonies and the chords. But do mm -hmm. you come at it some from more of like a rhythmic 
side, like when you're I, approaching something? I wouldn't necessarily say I come from it. It's sort of rhythms first, unless I'm unless I'm writing a piece of music that is sort of heavily rhythm rhythmic and will rely a lot on that. Uh -huh. um, I would say that I approach the even the harmony and the melody probably in a different way than a pianist would, you know, because I'm not, um, you know, when, when I'm trying to write music, I don't sit down in front of a piano and try to find the chords and the melodies sort of under my fingers. Um, I sort of, if I do that, it, it doesn't come out very good because I'm not a great pianist. So I have to, <laughs> I have to back away from that and sort of try to figure out in my head first. And then I might sing, you know, I might sing into a microphone or I might just sort of try to notate what I'm, what I'm hearing in my head or something like that. But I don't, um, I try not to use the piano too much because it, it, it slows me down because I'm not a, you know, I, I don't know where all the keys are and, you know, and, and where the next chords are supposed to come at, at least not mechanically. So I have to back wow. away from that a little bit. How interesting. So you hear yeah. it in your head. Do you hear the whole harmony in your head or do you just hear a melody in your head when you're composing? How does that? Yeah, I, wish I, I wish I heard the whole freaking piece and then I could just <laughs> put it right back. <laughs> um, I, I usually, it, it's like, a, it, it's almost like, I, it might sound a little, a little woo, but it's almost like I hear echoes of kind of what I'm going for, okay. you know? Um, usually, usually I write in the context of, you know, writing a score for a film or something like mm -hmm. that. So it, it's always kind of tied into with the story of what I'm, what I'm working on. And it's almost like I, I feel, um, I sense sort of an emotional pull towards a, dire a direction or a different direction. And, and that gives me almost like colors or, or sometimes I'm writing with synths and with electronic things. Um, and so I, I don't know if that answers your question. I don't even, I don't think it answers it for me either, <laughs> but it's, it's usually, it's either melody or textures or, or a combination of both. And then it's like, I, I, I think I get just enough in my head to go to the next step and then I'll inquire again. And then at some point, I, I hope that it comes, you know, that, that something a little bit more fleshed out comes out. Okay. So now, um, I'm sorry, this fascinates me so much to see how oh, you're, okay. so I hope you don't mind talking about this. So you have this and you have these textures, you have something in your head and then you flesh them out. So does that mean that you're co composing straight into your digital audio workstation or are you going straight to sheet music and writing with uh, mm. paper and pencil? So what, yeah, go ahead. yeah so, sometimes, sometimes I'll go straight to the DAW and I'll, I'll sit down and I'll just, I'll start, you know, laying things down that are just I either fully orchestrated or almost fully orchestrated. Uh, and that's, that's great. And that works nicely. And other times it's not like that. Other times, um, I might just, you know, literally I'll grab my phone and I'll, and I'll, a, a melody will come to my mind and I'll, I'll sing it right into the, into the phone and sort of, you know, maybe I'll sing a few different iterations of it. And, uh, and then I'll, I'll, it, it usually ends up going to the digital audio workstation so that I can then sort of flesh it out and mm -hmm. figure out what instruments it needs to be and so on. But it, it kind of usually, it changes depending on the project, depending on sort of what, what's fastest and, and what's more convenient. Um, so it's, it's not always the same. <laughs> yeah, each project is yeah. going to be different for sure. So now you, but you didn't start formal training until you were in high school. Um, Correct. But then you are a graduate of Berkeley College of Music, which is not an easy program. So how did you get from Brazil to Berkeley? Good question. Uh, a lot of very good uh, music teachers in Brazil really, really helped me. Um, I had one teacher in particular. I gave him a shout out a few times already. I don't know if he'll be hearing this because he doesn't speak English. But <laughs> Gustavo, if you're hearing me, thank you. Uh, my, one, of my, one of my teachers, Gustavo, uh, taught me almost everything that I learned prior to going to Berkeley. Guitar, uh, and he taught me, he kind of took me under his wing because I just, I just wanted to learn so much. So he took me, taught me guitar and ear training and harmony and composition and it, classical harmony and jazz harmony and uh, just a number of different things because he knew they were going to be important because at that point I, I already was kind of gravitating towards film composition and he was really encouraging uh, 
to me in, in that uh, in that pursuit. He knew sort of the things that I was going to be expected to know if I wanted to get into Berkeley. Mm-hmm. And he literally made a list, and over the course, I think, of a year or two, we were going in depth about all of these things. And so it it it, it came to the point that when I got to Berkeley, I actually was able to skip a few of the initial courses um, because of the stuff that he taught me prior. So wow. really, really helpful. Wow. Just yeah. shows what great teachers can do for people. It can really- changed everything. It really did. Isn't that amazing? Yeah. That's amazing. And so um, <laughs> since then, you really have become an expert in a lot of different things. You've done orchestration, you've done um, conducting, you've done music editing, you, you've kind of dipped your toes in a lot of different aspects of music, but you're saying that that um, can be somewhat typical in mm-hmm. a musician's career. Is Right. Can you go over that a little bit about yeah, what you sure. did I, when you were starting out? Absolutely, and I wouldn't say that I consider myself an expert on all of those things, um, <laughs> but I, you know, I'm, I'm trying. Uh, when you want to work with music professionally, there are so many different paths you can take. And, you know, and sometimes some of these paths are, are choices and you go, okay, th- this is exactly where I want to go. And other one, other paths are just kind of, you know, these are some of the things that I need to, that I, that I, that I'll need to do at this point in my career to sort of be able to pay the bills and sort of stay afloat so that I can go a little bit closer to maybe what my final goal is. In the beginning of, of my sort of musical career, I was I, I, I'm, I was just kind of saying yes to to almost all of the opportunities that came my way. Um, to in many ways, I still do that, and uh, now I'm becoming a little bit more selective. But uh, you know, whatever comes my way from my network of other composers or musicians or or filmmakers or so on, uh, I. I'd be willing to do, you know, and that might be uh, composition, that might be orchestrating, that might be working in score preparation, that might be uh, doing, you know, music editing or or orchestral mock-ups or music production. You know, there's just a ton of different things, and I would say that all of them are, are helpful to understand for for my final goal, you know, which which was always to be a composer. But that's kind of how it came about for me. I love how you said that all of these things kind of pointed you towards the goal, your ultimate goal of being a composer. But I also love that you recognized the importance of these other aspects as well. So can we just kind of go over like for, you know, you said you're not like an expert at any of these things, but you have experience in them. Like music editing is a little bit more technical than composing. But how does knowing that technical aspect help you as a composer in your creative parts? Yeah, good good question. Uh, I would say even, you know, especially in a modern context, when you're composing for for media, for movies and TV and so on, it, it it's a very creative process, but there is a very, very technical side to it, right? Especially if you're doing most of the things yourself, like like not only coming up with the music, but creating orchestral mock-ups, you know, uh, using virtual instruments and music production techniques and so on. So these things are, are pretty technical, but, um, and so in my, at, le- at least in my experience, the music editing side of things kind of helped me get acquainted with a lot of the tools that you end up using for composition. So that's one thing. And then there is another side, which is music editing is a pretty technical art, I would say, but it is all, there's also, there's a, there's an interestingly creative aspect in there because um, specifically when you're doing it for movies, you need to you need to be very attuned to sort of the the dramatic dramatic arc of a scene, mm-hmm. you know, and how the music is supposed to ebb and flow in that. And that's I mean, that that is the bread and butter of a composer. When you get to composition, you need to be able to shape the scene with your music and understand when it needs to speed up or slow down or, you know, get thicker orchestrally or thin out a little bit more. So these things are hugely important. And I think music editing, it helped me sort of understand a lot of, a lot of those details. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So how did you learn to do all these things? Were you working in groups? Did you work for companies? Were you assistants? What was the trajectory of your career? Good question. Uh, I would say all of the above. No. <laughs> um, so I've I've dipped my toes in all of those different things. You know, I've 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 done 
things sort of as a freelancer and just kind of coming in as a contract worker for for a project for a few months or a few weeks and then sort of dipping out. Um, I've been part of teams of composers and sound designers where, you know, I was maybe on staff, you know, for 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 a certain number of months and then uh, working on very, not just one project, but all of the projects that were coming down the pipeline of, of a particular company. Um, I've worked as uh, I've assisted, you know, composers. And, and so it's just all of the above, I think, were are were definitely part of my trajectory. Mm hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So you have to be very flexible, it seems. Yes. Yes. <laughs> and, and, you know, and this is something I tell people a lot when we're thinking about sort of a career in music. Uh, you don't have to only be creative in your music making, but you also have to be creative in how you sort of structure your career because you'll need to sort of reinvent yourself all the time to be able to, you know, participate in various opportunities that might come your way. Mm -hmm. So when you're being creative with this and you're planning your career and you're saying yes to everything, how do you mm -hmm. not lose sight of the ultimate goal of I want to be composer? Of course, not every opportunity that you might take will take you to the direction that you want, right? So let's say, let's say your let's say your goal is to be a media composer, right? Uh, uh, and you're offered a, a music editing gig or or a an orchestration gig or a, or, or something that is a, or a score prep gig in a movie, right? Those things, even though they're not exactly taking you right down the, like a straight path into composition, it's, it is taking you in that general direction, right? And mm -hmm. I found that over the course of your career, at least, at least in my experience, and I'm, I'm no expert and I'm no hot shot by any means, um, <laughs> but you, you do a number of course corrections over, over the course of time. So, mm -hmm say you're going into the general direction of being involved in the world of, of film music, um, you can, there is, a, there is a certain amount of course correction that you can do to kind of begin getting closer and closer to the role that you want to be at, yes. at the end of, of the day, you know, I hope yeah. that makes sense with all those. That does analogies. make sense. Yeah, <laughs> no, it <laughs> absolutely makes sense. But then along the way, you can also in, enjoy and yeah. really learn from the things that you're doing, or maybe even get nominated for an Emmy like you have. <laughs> so <laughs> congratulations. Do you want to talk a little bit about that experience? Certainly. Um, so again, you know, piggybacking right off of what we were saying. Right. Um, I, I, was, I was involved in, in this project. It was a TV show called Go Go Corey Carson. Um, and I was, I was brought in as a music editor for that, which again, it's not, it's not really what I consider myself. I don't consider myself a music editor necessarily, but the opportunity came and someone needed to do that job. And I thought, yeah, I can, I can do it. You know, I can, I can take it on. Um, because I, I knew that I, I, I was, I was very familiar with the tools of music editing. Um, it is something that I learned when I was in, in college uh, among all the other different things that I learned uh, sort of music wise. So I was familiar with the tools. I knew I could do a good job. Um, and that's important when you're saying yes to opportunities, you know, the, the, some people say that you should say yes, even if you don't know how to do the thing. Um, it, it can be a little dangerous. You know, if you if you get into a high pressure job and you don't know what you're doing. Oh, yeah. Uh, it, that, it, it can be bad. So uh, yeah. I would say it, it, use caution with that. But <laughs> so I was but I, I was brought in as, as a music editor. And um, it's it's exactly what you were saying, which is you can still enjoy the thing that you're doing, even if it's not directly what you're what you want to be doing in the end. And, um, and I would say it's kind of just how I work and my, my personality. I, I felt myself that I had a, I had a duty to do a great job, you know, to do the best job that I possibly could. And so, so I figured out how to do that and how to, how to really help the team and help the project in the best way I could. And, and it was awesome. It was, it was a great experience. And, um, and then I was very fortunate that at the end, I was I was nominated for an Emmy for that, which was fantastic. I totally didn't expect it, and it was kind of a it was a highlight in the career so far for sure. Yeah, well, seriously, congratulations! Like, thank you so much. What an amazing honor for that. Um, but then when you're when you're nominated for this Emmy, did did you ever get like this little thing, this little voice in the back of your head thinking, hmm, maybe I should keep, maybe I should pivot and go to this music editor path? Or yeah. were you like, no, nope, I'm a composer through and through. 
not changing. Yeah, I've, de- I've definitely had that voice and it's still, it hasn't, it hasn't stopped talking. You know, it's like, it, <laughs> it is still sometimes in the back of my head thinking, well, you know, it could, it, it's a, it could be a path, you know, it could be a, a great career path and, and something that, that obviously, uh, I, I, I can, I can do a good job in and I can, and I can contribute. So absolutely. Sometimes, sometimes it crosses my mind for sure. Yeah. But that, that composition just pulls you back every time. For, you know, for, for now, I'm going to keep going down that, that direction. Cause I, it's something I really love doing. And it's something that, um, most of my opportunities and, and my sort of day to day work is in that, in that field. Yeah. So, um, we'll, we'll, we'll keep pushing on that. <laughs> <laughs> well, you, um, you had an amazing opportunity to tour with an orchestra and to mm-hmm. compose a score for the freshman and perform it on stage mm-hmm. with you conducting it. And I think what an amazing opportunity that must that have been. Fun. And what an in, yeah, incredible project. Can you kind of just tell me about it? Yeah, for sure. Uh, so as you said, that, that project, um, I was, I was, I was one of the main composers. So it was myself and, a, and, and a few other, uh, friends of mine. And what we did is that we re we re scored a, a old timey silent, silent film. So it was a 1922 film by Harold Lloyd, who for, for those who aren't familiar with him, he was one of the three big, uh, comedic, uh, directors of the time. And, the freshman is a is a really fun movie. It's very sweet and it's and it's totally silent. There's no sound. There's no dialogue. There's nothing like that in the movie. So the only thing we had to sort of drive the movie forward was the music, and it was an amazing, uh, very collaborative project. The icing on the cake was to be able to get an orchestra. It was a small orchestra, but still uh, to conduct that orchestra and sort of we did sort of a U.S. tour. You know, we we played in a few places and the East coast and the West coast. And it was wonderful. It was, it was very well received. People seemed to really like it. And it was another definite highlight in, in my career. Yeah. So you're up there conducting your music with a live <laughs> orchestra in mm-hmm. a silent film where you did not have to worry about overshadowing the dialogue or anything right. like that. I mean, what was going through, come through right? <laughs> right? Like what was going through your head as you are up there doing this? Uh, please let me not mess this up. That was what... <laughs> <laughs> no, yeah, you're was... a performer. Yeah, that's that's about yeah. right. <laughs> <laughs> no, and, and in all seriousness, as a conductor, um, I think what I what you're trying to do the most is to um, is to transfer sort of your um, well, the, the name says it all, right? You want to conduct the sort of the electricity that the music is causing in you, and you want to conduct that to the musicians, you know, and sort right. of make make everybody operate as one. Uh huh. And then you have the audience, and you're connecting with them and their energy. Yeah. So, were you having to watch the screen to make sure your music was matching? Oh yeah, the- yeah. So, um, one of the things that we were doing is we had actually. So, you have two screens when you're when you're doing something like that. You have the big screen, which is where what the audience sees, and you have uh, a little laptop right in front of you, which only you see as the conductor. And that has, you know, if you've ever seen old movie recordings, you know, uh, recording sessions, you see those lines and and that that sort of run across the screen, and then those flashes. We call mm-hmm. those punches and streamers in in the movie world. So that's a that's kind of a visual aid to help you conduct and know where the downbeats are supposed to be the tempo changes and so on. So everything was like meticulously mapped out so that the music was always falling exactly where it was supposed to, because there are, you know, like I said, it was a slapstick comedy. So there's times when, you know, somebody is getting hit in the head with a, with an object or somebody's falling down or, you know, there's something, there's something visual that the music needs to accent exactly at the right time. And so you need to make sure that you're very tightly synced with the mm-hmm. picture and with the orchestra. So if you have all of these uh, markers in there, you probably had a lot of practicing to do conducting yes. that to make sure your tempos were right on. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. So we were all working under one of our mentors who is, his name is Sheldon Mirowitz. And he was kind of the, he was the, I would say creative director at, at the end of the day. Each composer had about 15, a 15 minute chunk 
oh. of film. And it was like a 15 continuous minute of, of, of movie. Really? To score. Yeah. So then it, it was fun too. In the live performance, you would, um, you'd have to switch conductors like live because, you know, it's like somebody wrote this 15 minute and then now it's the next 15 minutes and the next 15 minutes. So it was this kind of, uh, what do you call it? That shifting chair, uh, dance you know, game that people play. I forget what it's called. Um, oh, musical so, chairs. Musical yeah. chairs. Yes. Yeah. So it was kind of like playing musical chairs as a conductor. <laughs> oh, how interesting. So since you were changing, did, <clears throat> were you able to have your own voice in your composing or were you trying to match each other? We were trying to match each other. You were trying to match each yeah. other. Okay. Mm-hmm. Trying to make it seamless so the audience couldn't tell. Exactly. exactly. How'd you do that? Well, it's, it, it's a lot of, you know, in the process of writing the music, first of all, we were, we were all using the same themes. Right. Okay. So that already creates a cohesion just by default. We were all using the same orchestra, which also creates another bit of cohesion. And it was, we were all listening to each other's stuff while we were writing. So okay. you're, you're kind of, it's a, it was a very collaborative project and you're sort of bouncing ideas off of each other and just making sure that you don't do anything that's, that sort of stands out too much, you know, so it's all sort of one continuous thing. Yeah. That sounds like such a fun project. Yeah. That must have been just so great. So now, so you are successful in pretty, it sounds like you're successful in pretty much everything you're trying. So (laughs) I'm excited about this new venture that you're doing, uh, the Music Giant, this music production studio. Why don't you tell me a little bit about that and where you're wanting to go with that? Yeah, definitely. Uh, So I, it's kind of like my music giant is sort of an experiment of mine um, where I, I know that, you know, I've, I've been sort of planning on what it will look like to build a team sort of underneath me as a composer in the, in the sort of film scoring and media scoring world. I see, I, I think there's a tendency that people will gravitate more and more towards having teams of composers rather than, than sort of just one person doing everything. Mm -hmm. So I'm trying to anticipate that with the music giant and having, you know, and, and being able to bring people in to work on the projects that I'm, that I'm working on, be able to, uh, supply sort of the, what, what, what's demanded of a composer. I want to sort of be able, I want to be able to anticipate that and have people underneath me and people that are collaborating with me in, in the various projects that I work on. So, the music giant is kind of my, my attempt at that. I don't know if that makes any sense, right. but it's kind of my, my, uh, uh, composing collective, I, I suppose is, is a, is a way of thinking about it. Okay. Okay. Yeah. So that way you have your team set in place already. So when a, a job comes in, in house, in the music giant, you have the orchestrators, you have the editors, you have the arranging all of that all ready to go. Something like that. Yeah. Something like that is, is the idea. Yeah. Something like that, but not completely yeah. like that. Well, so, so, um, I think each, each project that comes my way has, it, it can have such a different sort of, um, need, right? So okay. some projects might need a certain amount of music and it's all, uh, uh, you, you do it all in the computer, right? In the box. So you don't mm-hmm. need to record live. So in that case, I probably wouldn't need an orchestrator or somebody to do score prep or so on, but maybe I'll need a mixer, a mix engineer at the end, right? So that would uh, that person would have to be part of that project. And then other projects, you might need to record a bunch of music live, right? So then you would need an orchestrator and, a, and, a, and somebody to do score prep and so on. So I'm not sure that it would that I would have all of those people sort of in-house at all times. Okay. But more of like a, a, a pro, you know, something on a project basis or something like that. It's still, you know, it, it's kind of in its early stages of sort of conceptualizing it. So it's something I'm, I'm kind of thinking about and figuring out as I go. Oh, well, that's exciting. So that's, that's why it's, it's something like that. And I'm trying to figure out what's, what's the best way to go about it. Yeah. Oh, and that's why you're saying it's a collective because it has to be flexible to fit. Sort of. Yeah, exactly. All of the different things. Oh, that's interesting. Well, that's really, really fun. It has been so fun chatting with you. Do you have any fun um, projects that you're working on now that are that we should be looking out for? Yes. Um, I just uh, was part of the music team for a, 
uh, it's a zombie comedy, if you can believe that. It's a, you know, I've been told it's called a zomcom now, the, the, the genre. <laughs> uh, okay. It's a movie called Zombie Town. It has, uh, it has Dan Aykroyd and Chevy Chase in it, which is it was oh just a, a, a total blast to work on. <laughs> So Zombie Town is something to look out for. That that should be a super fun evening. Okay. So something to look out for. Well, um, I don't usually watch Zomcoms, but I suppose that I'll have to go and, <laughs> and watch this. I'll make an exception. I'll make an exception this time. It actually sounds funny, so this will be fun. I'll yeah. definitely check that one out for sure. Um, Vinicius, this has been so fun. As we finish up. What last minute advice do you have for any aspiring composers or aspiring musicians just in general? Mm, good question. Um, there's something I tell people often and, and something I, I experienced in my career early on, uh, which is, you know, no matter what direction you end up taking and, and sort of what you end up doing, I, I find it really important to constantly come back to what it was that really um inspires you and really really makes you love music you know like i think all of us who are musicians or or who work in the arts in general there's probably a, a time in your life when when you know something gripped you you know when when you were you were kind of amazed by by a project that you worked or that that you saw or the a movie you watched or a piece of music you listened to um i would say try to go back to that feeling that place often because I think that that helps you kind of be renewed often, you know, mm -hmm. and sort of come back to it in a fresh perspective and without um, without feeling burnt out and, and all that. At least for me, it's something that when you begin trying to make a living out of it, you can very quickly lose sight of why did you love this thing in the first place. So to me, it was helpful to kind of just know how to come back to that place and operate from within that. Right. I don't know if that makes sense, but it absolutely is, does. Yeah. 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 Just keep that passion alive and remember why you're doing it in the first place. That's that's it. That's yeah. It. <laughs> it's, <laughs> it's great. Well, Vinicius Barbosa Pippa, it has been such a pleasure chatting with you. I appreciate your time. Thank you so much for talking with me. Thank you very much for having me. I really appreciate it. <laughs>